Let's have a look at corporate governance, why we need it, what exactly it is and what constitutes best practice. Corporate governance is required because of a divorce between ownership and control. Shareholders own a business and they have their own objectives. What they would like the directors to do in the business is to work to ensure that their own objectives are met, to make sure the shareholders' objectives are met. But directors have their own objectives too, and they may on occasion differ from what the shareholders want. So for example, um, if the directors are being paid a bonus based on profits produced for this year, it's no surprise that directors will work hard to produce profits for this year. That's not necessarily the same as producing long-term shareholder wealth. I could increase my profits this year by cutting back on training, by cutting back on research and development, um, by cutting corners, um, and I would make a profit this year and a bonus, but it wouldn't necessarily be good for the business. So what corporate governance does is seek to try and ensure that the directors um, behave in such a way as to ensure that the shareholders' objectives are met. Now, corporate governance is fairly big picture. It's to do with the structure of the board, the roles of the directors on the board and the subcommittees on that board and how the board works, basically. Internal controls um, trickles down from there. So once you've got the governance structures right in the first place, internal controls uh, then follows. So corporate governance is the method by which organisations are directed and controlled. It's to do with the board structure, composition and roles. Now, starting off with um, board structure, there are um, various alternatives around the world for ways in which um, corporate governance structures are decided upon at a, at a senior level. Uh, some jurisdictions have what's known as a multi-tier system where they'll have a supervisory board, which is the senior board uh, on which non-executive directors sit. So everyone on that board has no executive responsibilities um, within the business, no operational responsibilities. And reporting into that supervisory board, we have a management board. And this is where all the executives sit. They're the people that um, have operational responsibilities in the business. So your head of finance, your head of HR, your head of IT will sit on the management board and report up to the, to the supervisory board. Keeping those two separate has lots of advantages uh, in that it means that you get the supervisory board are not in any way um, encumbered or um, threatened potentially by the executive directors being in the same meeting. Um, but it does mean that you have uh, lots of separate meetings going on and you don't have all the brains in the room at the same time when you're making key decisions. It's also a relatively expensive way to set it up because of all the meetings and the communication that's required between the two boards. The much more usual approach is for to have a unitary board structure, which just means the organisation has one board. Um, and on that board, there are the executive directors and the executive directors are people with operational responsibilities in the business and the non-executive directors, the people that are there purely to ensure that the business is being run on behalf of the shareholders. We're going to focus most of our attention on the unitary board uh, side of things because it's, it is most common in the real world. Now, corporate governance um, as a, a regulatory sort of environment can take one of two forms. We can either have a, a rules based approach and a rules based approach is where um, you have typically some legislation like uh, in the USA, we have the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, sometimes shortened to Sarbox. Uh, and that's a legal requirement for companies to follow um, the rules laid down in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And if you don't comply with uh, the requirements of that act, then there are legal consequences. You can be taken to court. You could potentially be um, sent to prison. That is relatively rare. It's a relatively sort of strict, uh, legally enforceable regime. The usual approach is to go for a more principles based approach, which is a little bit more flexible in its application. One of the issues with the rules based approach is that it's very difficult to come up with rules that suit every single set of circumstances. So with the principles based approach, you lay out best practice principles that can be applied flexibly in different um, in different circumstances. 
So the principles-based approaches outline best practice, and we'll come on to what that best practice um, generally um, is in a minute. And it's normally required to be uh, implemented on what's known as a comply or explain basis. This is slightly different from saying it's a, a voluntary code just because it's best practice. So for example, in the UK, if you're a listed business, um, a listed company on the stock exchange, then by virtue of being listed, you agree to apply the UK code on corporate governance uh, on a comply or explain basis, which means you need to state in your financial statements whether you fully comply with that code, or if you don't, uh, the way in which you don't and why you don't. And provided you've disclosed the way in which you don't comply, uh, then you're covered as far as the listing rules are concerned. And that means then the investors have all the information they need to then help them decide whether or not they're happy with your lack of compliance. And sort of in the background here is the thought that there could be a perfectly good reason why you don't or can't comply with one element of the corporate governance code. Uh, and it's up to then the investors to decide whether or not they're happy with that. One of the advantages that's often quoted for the principles-based approach is that the judgments are being made by the owners of the business here, the investors, as opposed to a rules-based approach where judgment is being made by, by the courts. So it's not voluntary, it's best practice. It's not voluntary if you're a listed business, so uh, you need to apply it on a comply or explain basis. Now, as far as um, international rules are concerned with corporate governance, generally speaking, corporate governance is a very jurisdiction or country-specific thing. But there are codes out there that are um, espousing general um, best practice and probably the best known is the OECD um, code which is quite a, a high level sort of code that talks about uh, the rights of shareholders uh, and, and so on and the obligations of directors and the International Corporate Governance Network, the ICGN, took the OECD framework uh, and made it uh, much more sort of applicable so it's kind of, kind of um, guidance notes to help people understand how to apply the principles in their own businesses. So the ICGN report is really uh, the best we have for international best practice as far as corporate governance is concerned. That said, um, that it's jurisdiction specific, as you go around the different jurisdictions in um, principles based approaches, they are all very similar and there's, and there's a lot of um, themes that flow through them all. And let's have a look at what constitutes best practice now. So for a unitary board, first of all, we have um, at least half the board made up of non-executive directors or NEDs as they're known for short. These people have no operational responsibility uh, on the board. They are typically part timers. They're um, usually paid a salary. Uh, they're often very experienced business people and they are there to uh, represent the needs of the shareholder. And the reason why we say we have at least 50% of the board being NEDs is that it means that any decisions cannot be dominated by people with operational responsibility within the business. So if you get um, the finance director, for example, who is an executive director because he's also head of finance, um, dominating decisions, they might be sidetracked or compromised by what's going on in their own department rather than thinking of the business as a whole. And to try and stop that from happening, we have um, a majority, um, or certainly we don't have a, a majority of executive directors, we have at least half the people in the room being non-executives and maybe there'll be a majority. So the four roles of a non-executive director, you can learn with this um, list of four words, SSRP, strategy, scrutiny, risk, and people. So they are there to contribute to the strategy of the business. Um, they are there to scrutinize the executive directors and to make sure that the decisions the executive directors make is in the best interest of the shareholders. They're there to ensure that risk management processes are in place and operating. And on the people side of things, they're there to make sure that the board has the right number of people on it, the right types of people on it. They've got the right sorts of roles. And that last one, people, tends to get sorted out through the various committees that we'll talk about in a moment. Another key principle of best practice is that the chairperson who runs the board um, and the CEO, the chief executive officer, who is the manager of the executives in the business, should be separate roles. There should be two separate people. If you have one person doing both those roles, first of all, it's a lot of work for one person to do, and you'd have to question whether they can do both roles well. Um, secondly, it puts an awful lot of power into one pair of hands, 
which might be um, a concern for shareholders and for the business. Um, and it also means that the chair and the CEO can keep their respective responsibilities completely apart. So the chairperson runs the board, the CEO runs the business. And yes, the two can sort of bounce ideas off each other. Um, and hopefully we get better answers as a result. But keeping the roles separate ultimately should mean that the board um, and the executive function in the business operate a little bit more independently and a little bit better. And then uh, various board subcommittees. Uh, the majority of best practice codes uh, say there should be three board uh, subcommittees, the Audit Committee, the Nomination Committee and the Remuneration Committee. The Audit Committee um, reviews the financial statements. It is the clearance point for internal and external audit. And the reason for that is that the Audit Committee is made up of typically three um, non-executive directors, independent non-executive directors, at least one of which needs to have relevant and recent financial experience. So they know what they're, where they're, what they're doing when they're reading a set of financial statements and they are relatively independent, which means if internal audit clear to them, uh, internal auditor therefore independent, um, and if external audit clear to them, that helps make their role a little bit easier because you don't want, for example, external audit to be clear into the finance director if the external audit um, team have got something to say about the way the finance department is run. So they clear internal audit, external audit, uh, review the financial statements. And they'll also, if there isn't a separate risk committee, and we'll come on to the risk committee in a minute, they'll also take responsibility for ensuring that there is a, a risk management process in place and operating. The nomination committee uh, is to do with uh, who is on the board. So nomination naming. So who is named as directors on the, on the board. And they'll consider things like the structure of the board, how big it needs to be. Um, whether we should um, have more internally promoted people or bring people in from the outside. They'll consider issues like uh, diversity uh, and so on uh, and make recommendations for approval. The remuneration committee looks at how directors are paid. So they'll look at things like um, the proportion of fixed salary to, to, to bonus or performance related pay. And with the performance related pay, they'll make sure it's sufficient to motivate directors, but not so excessive that it causes them to take silly risks. And they'll make sure that it's, it's structured in such a way as to encourage um, the directors to work towards uh, the long-term goals of the shareholders. So they'll set the, the pay effectively for the executive directors in the business. It's also becoming increasingly common these days for there to be a fourth committee, uh, the, a risk committee, to take the responsibility off the audit committee and give risk management a bit of specific focus. Now, that's, that's good in many ways. Not only does it give it specific focus, it also means that we can get some executive directors involved. Because remember, the audit committee is made up of non-executive directors. So if the audit committee are looking after risk, then there won't be any executive directors involved directly in um, looking after risk. So the risk committee gives a, um, a bit of separate consideration um, to make sure that risk management is given the profile that it needs and the focus that it needs to operate well within the business. So they're the general sort of principles of best practice that you'll see with corporate governance. There are various others, but that's, that's the, the main ones. Most corporate governance codes um, and this is based on the on the UK code, but this would be um, the same for um, any codes really around the world. Uh, focus on these five areas. So they'll look at leadership. So they'll look at the role of the chairman and the role of the, the CEO um, and, and make sure those roles are separate and how, how they work and make sure they work together well. And the effectiveness of the board. So making sure, for example, that directors have sufficient time to do their job. They have sufficient information given to them in sufficient time before meetings to enable them to come to well-reasoned decisions. And they ensure accountability of the board and clarify accountability of the different members of the board. They've got the different subcommittees there, but also to clarify that the board of directors are responsible for the performance and operations of the business as a whole. To ensure that directors are remunerated in an appropriate way. Uh, to encourage them to think like shareholders and to behave how shareholders would want them to behave. And also to ensure they maintain relationships with those shareholders. So, for example, not, not seeing the annual general meeting as a purely legal administrative exercise, but using the AGM as a way to communicate with shareholders and to get shareholders involved in making key decisions in the business. 
Uh, it's also increasingly common to identify particular non-executive directors, sometimes called a senior um, ex non-executive director, uh, to give them as a point of contact for shareholders to contact if they have any questions um, throughout the year to try and improve relations with shareholders. As a general point to finish on for the exam, although um, there is a lot of sort of ideas and concepts surrounding corporate governance, if you imagine being a shareholder and you're employing somebody else to look after your business for you, if you think about the kind of things that you would worry about and how you'd make yourself feel better about those things, the sort of the control mechanisms you'd put in place, you usually find that what you're actually doing is describing the corporate governance code. So they, ha they have an underlying logic to them uh, which helps us um, in exams. Thanks for listening.